Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wellness and Recovery Series. Today, we're really excited to bring you um, a great piece on alternatives to opioids and the treatment of acute pain. We all know that pain is a big reason that people seek medical care and against in amidst our current opioid epidemic, we can't rely on opioids to treat minor and chronic pain. We need better, effective, and safe ways to manage pain. And these presenters are going to give us some of those great alternatives, which there are many. So um, what today we have with us Dr. Alicia Kurtz and Dr. Sky Lee. Um, Dr. Kurtz is the Assistant Medical Director of the Emergency Department at Mercy San Juan Medical Center in Sacramento, California. And she's also the Regional Director for the California Bridge Program, which is where we found out about these great presenters. Um, and through the California Bridge, they help establish emergency department-based medicated assisted treatment programs in hospitals across California. And she is also the Alternative to Opioids Champion for Dignity Health and the host of Real Talk podcast, and um, where she helps share stories of human experiences of those working in medicine. She's passionate about shifting the culture of healthcare towards treating patients and providers with more compassion and bringing joy back to the bedside. Outside of medicine, she loves travel adventures, same as me, and trying new things. Her amazing supportive partner, Marco, yoga, and all things Trader Joe's, which we don't have one of those here. We wish we had one. And Dr. Sky Lee, is an assistant professor of family medicine at UC Davis and the assistant director of inpatient services for the California Bridge Program. She works both in outpatient and inpatient setting and her medical interests include HIV, substance use disorder and reproductive justice for the medically underserved. Her non-medical interests include rock climbing, exploring the outdoors and eating delicious foods. So hello and welcome. <laughs> Hi. I just want to give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves, even though you guys gave me those lovely bios and I was able to <laughs> give that. And then we'll go back and do a little housekeeping. I have nothing else interesting to say. That was pretty much it. But I'm, I'm Alicia. So <laughs> thanks for having us here. Yes. And same here. Nothing real um, much to add after that. But I'm Sky. I'm really glad to be here. And I'm glad that we have um, people attending and interested in this topic. Yes, it's a really important topic and this is going to be recorded for future use for those who can't make this time as well. So, cause we know it's hard during the day, especially for medical providers to make it. So we wanna make it available over time too for them. All right, so just a little housekeeping that we do for all of our presentations. Um, we just wanna make sure that we are creating a safe space for everyone. So um, part of that is these group agreements you know, respect and kindness are key. Um, please be respectful. If you're not being respectful in the chat or in the Zoom, we will ask you to, or we will remove you. Um, but, <laughs> but we expect that everybody here is here for the right reasons and we want them to be able to participate. Always, as always, show tolerance of differences. Participants may come from different backgrounds, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, all those different backgrounds that we may differ and may cause different viewpoints. So please respect other people's viewpoints and use positive language as much as possible. Um, that goes along with the safe safe space free of judgment. Also, because this is being recorded and because this is out on social media, we, please respect people's privacies. When sharing stories, please share stories, please share your personal experiences. Those are great, but please leave people's names out of it, especially um, for that privacy piece. I'm sure the doctors are super experienced with HIPAA <laughs> and really trying to make sure that we're protecting people's privacies. We wanna do that in, in this space as well. So if you're sharing a story, you can just say a person or someone I know to you um, if you're sharing not your own story. And um, always, as always, ask for clarification if you don't understand. We want to make sure that people are getting the most out of these. So questions are great. And because we are talking about heavy issues such as opioid use and, op and disorders and addiction and all of those things, if this does trigger something for you, please reach out. Um, to, we've provided some of this information um, around mental health services and things like that. So please reach out if this does trigger something for you or if you just want to talk to somebody because it's COVID and things are crazy. <laughs> 
And again, just respecting people's privacy and reminding you that this is recorded and it is on social media. Also, we always want to acknowledge the land that we're on and we, this is an acknowledgement of the land that we are on, but um, you may be tuning in from a different area or our, provi our providers today come from a different area. So just taking that moment to really understand the indigenous lands that you're on and honoring that. Um, for us, we have many indigenous peoples in our areas, including the uh, Talawa Dene, Yurok, Karuk, Hoopa, Wiat, and many rancherias, including Elk Valley, Resagini, Big Lagoon, Trinidad, Blue Lake, Table Bluff, and Ronerville. And we want to acknowledge these and honor these indigenous people who have lived here and cared for this land and each other since time immemorial. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have been the stewards of this land for generations. We know the effects of colonization have infected the indigenous peoples disproportionately, and we hope that through this series, we can learn together and move towards a healthy future. And at the end, there will be a evaluation, and each evaluation also gets entered into some raffle prizes with some really great wellness. We have activities, we have cool swag, we have all sorts of um, books and teas and cool stuff that we're going to be handing out. So make sure you do those evals so you get entered into that raffle. All right, and I will now stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Dr. Lee and Dr. Kurt. Awesome. Let me just hopefully successfully switch this. Are you seeing the slides? Ah, yes. Always good when technology is on our side. <laughs> okay. So, um, both Dr. Lee and I can realize that usually when we're giving a talk like this, there's a little bit of preaching to the choir that's involved in it because people who, who come here to listen to this kind of topic often don't need to know uh, as much history uh, as we normally like to cover. So if you're not uh, super well versed with the history of the opioid epidemic or the role that medical professionals play uh, in that epidemic in our country, I would encourage you to research that a little bit. We'll touch on it, but we're not going to spend a lot of time. Um, but hopefully we're able to give you a lot of good information that uh, you can take home with you. And Here's what we're gonna cover. We're gonna talk about what ALTO is, alternatives to opioids, um, and a bunch of different protocols that ways that you can treat pain without using opioids. Then, as all of us continue to do more work in MAT, or medication for addiction treatment with medicines like buprenorphine, Dr. Lee is gonna walk us a little bit through how to take care of patients who have opioid use disorder and are using buprenorphine to treat that opioid use disorder, what happens when they get acute pain? And so she'll talk about ways to manage that. Um, really importantly, we'll talk a little bit about doing better patient education and expectation setting when taking care of pain for our patients. And then finally, we're gonna talk about uh, opioid prescriber guidelines and what next steps are um, for you in taking care of patients. So first, what is ALTO? Uh, and I mentioned that I was going to cover a tiny bit of history here. This is the only slide about it. Uh, I'm guessing that you've probably seen it before. I feel like everyone has, even in the regular news. Um, but it basically just shows the significant rise of the number of opioid-related deaths that have happened in the past few years. You can see a pretty steep uptick in that curve. This is not new news. But the reason that we bring this up in healthcare is that of all of these deaths from opioids, 36% of them are from a prescription-related opioid overdose. That's about 50 people every day that die from overdosing, intentionally or not, on their prescribed opioid medication. So this is Norco, Percocet, uh, Methadone, any of those medicines. And these are non-diverted medications either. So a third of the opioid-related deaths are from us, are from us kind of irresponsibly prescribing opioids for pain, often in times when we don't need to. Um, I will take two beats. One is to say, we will acknowledge openly there is a time and a place for opioids in healthcare. Thank God we have them. There are definitely situations where we should be using opioids. Like if I break my femur, I really hope someone doesn't withhold a strong payment for me uh, in the hospital. But generally speaking, there are a lot of times when it's not needed. And we end up seeing patients on, on opioids long term who shouldn't be. And we can do our part in reducing this third of deaths that come from prescription related overdoses. That's that's on us in medicine to address this portion. 
So the Department of Health, Health and Human Services has a, a pretty detailed five-point strategy to combat the opioid epidemic. Um, and in that strategy, there are three main pillars, uh, two of which, recovery and harm reduction, uh, people are doing a lot of work in. So recovery is, again, this idea of medication-assisted treatment, getting people on some medicines to help them with their chronic substance use disorder, for example, buprenorphine or methadone, um, naltrexone is another one people will use. Harm reduction, this idea that we can decrease the amount of harm people experience when using drugs, decreasing transmission rates of HIV, hepatitis, um, helping coach patients with safe injection practices, realizing that they should have Narcan around even if they're using um, you know, things are using methamphetamines just because we know that there's a lot of fentanyl now being laced in these drugs. So the idea of reducing death and disease that comes along with using drugs. And we're pretty good at these two. We have always room for improvement, but we're getting much better at them. This one area, though, of prevention is where alternatives to opioids come in. The main principle of this concept being that if you use alternatives to opioids when managing pain and you never expose somebody to opioids to begin with, you're going to help prevent that addiction. We know that 6% of people, after only a five-day prescription of opioids, five days, go into long-term use of opioid medicines. Six in 100 people. That's a lot, actually. And so if we can use safe and effective alternatives for pain and do a good job controlling people's pain without using opioids, that 6%, 6 in 100 people are not going to go into long-term use, which ultimately is going to save lives, which is great. So when somebody, again, comes in with a truly life-threatening emergency, there's a place for opioids. However, 42% of the 140 million visits to the ER every year are pain-related. And as a practicing emergency medicine doctor, I will tell you, of those patients I see who complain of some kind of pain, no way do all of them need opioids. Um, and currently, the national average is that 17% of those patients complaining of pain receive opioids. And so when I think about all the patients I see with pain, which ones I'm able to control their pain without using opioids, it's most of them. I definitely don't need opioids to control pain for, for 17 or more percent of those patients. And so when you think about just the sheer number of people complaining of pain, and that normally our approach has always been, hey, somebody has pain, let's grab the opioids. We really need to work to change the conversation to actually someone has pain, my reflexive action is to order a bunch of other stuff that's not addictive or non, not going to suppress their respiratory drive. I'm going to go to those things first and then use opioids if those aren't working or reserve the opioids for really severe pain or cancer-related pain or, you know, again, broken femurs, those kinds of things. So that's sort of the principle of where this idea comes from. And the basic goals of the program are, again, to use non-opioid approaches as first line realizing there's a role for opioids, but that the role shouldn't be first line in most instances of mild to moderate acute pain. Um, again, continuing to use opioids as a rescue medication, discussing openly realistic expectations with our patients, since this is definitely a culture change in the U.S. to not always be grabbing morphine for an ankle sprain, um, and then also to, to openly discuss addiction potential and side effects of opioids, which we don't do a lot of education with our patients about. And the way that we tackle pain when we're not using opioids is to realize that there are tons of different receptors in our body that cause pain. And so we're not just going to go after the mu receptor or the opioid receptor, but we've got the COX, uh, different COX receptors. We have the NMDA receptor. We have um, nerve endings, GABA, sodium channels, all different ways that people experience pain. And mu is only one of them. And so the idea of also is to use the medications you can see on this slide, NSAIDs, acetaminophen, steroids, Haldol, different mechanisms to attack those different pathways for pain and not only uh, to be using the mu receptor with opioids. These protocols were developed at a hospital called St. Joseph's. It's located in New Jersey, and I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to their, uh, the creators of the program who are very good friends and mentors of mine, Dr. Mark Rosenberg and Dr. Alexis LaPietra. And after they just developed these protocols in their hospital and rolled out this, this program, this alternative to opioid education and order sets and stuff, what they saw is that they were able in two years to decrease the number of opioid prescriptions written at discharge by 80% from their ER. 
And at the same time, they decreased the amount of opioid doses given um, by 38%, which is a ton. Interestingly, at the same time, their patient satisfaction scores went up and this did not have an effect on their volumes. So their community actually found out they were doing this and was excited to be able to bring in maybe the elderly or people who have chronic other medical comorbidities or who heard that they were doing these efforts to not use opioids. And the community was very happy with that. Their patient satisfaction was very high. They're still doing a great job controlling pain and not using opioids. So this is kind of the first big proof, the data behind the concept that this does work and that it's not gonna make all of our patients sad. It's actually very effective. And these are the basic protocols they developed. And we're just gonna skip this slide because we're gonna go right into them. So the first one, uh, hopefully you're very familiar with this kind of patient, right? You've got maybe a 40 um, something year old male. He has a history of kidney stones. looks like he's got kidney stone pain, right? He's very uncomfortable in chest, can't get comfy holding his flank. It burns when he pees. Maybe he's noticed some blood. And what do you do? I mean, we all know that renal colic is very painful. That's not a surprise to us. And so typically you'll see people, you know, grab the, the opioids, morphine, fluids are very common uh, choices. However, what we know from a lot of different studies is that first line treatment really ought to be Tylenol plus NSAIDs. So like, you know, acetaminophen uh, plus uh, ibuprofen, naproxen, or you can use Tordal. Really quick disclaimer, I use brand names in my speech all the time. I promise no one's paying me. Dr. Lee and I both don't have any uh, financial disclosures to give. I think I'm just, we're just used to saying the ones that we have in our hospital that we say on shift. So please don't interpret any brand name usage as brand loyalty. We have none of that. It's just what the, the words that we're more familiar with. So if I say Toradol and not Toralax, that kind of stuff, that's why. Just a practical, practical disclaimer. Anyways. Um, but lots of studies have shown that if you give Tylenol with an NSAID, it actually works better than if you give either of them alone. And an important note about the Toradol that you'll notice on the screen is that the IV dosing is 15 milligrams. We have learned that you don't need more than that, that even there's great data to show that uh, 10 milligrams might be enough. But generally speaking, the accepted, uh, the accepted guideline now is that 15 milligrams IV should be the maximum and 30 milligrams intramuscular. Um, and you give that with a liter bolus because the kidneys do love fluid. And then you add on the gram of Tylenol. Now, a quick dose about Tylenol. All of the evidence uh, using Tylenol shows that IV and PO actually work the same, that patients have the same outcomes. And I know we all have anecdotal experiences that argue differently, but it, with a couple of exceptions, including hip fractures, um, in which case IV was a little bit better, almost every other painful condition, Tylenol PO versus Tylenol IV have the same effectiveness, but Tylenol IV is like $1,000, uh, it's $40 on the hospital, hospital cost versus pennies for a gram of PO Tylenol. So it's cheaper for the hospital system, it's also much cheaper for the patient if we give the oral. So if the patient's able to tolerate oral, I recommend using oral Tylenol, and then you can go ahead and add that IV Tordal or intramuscular Tordal, so IV 15, or intramuscular 30 milligrams. And this should be your first line treatment a lot. You'd be surprised how often just that alone will work. But if the patient does need more than that, a great second line option is actually to use IV lidocaine. So IV lidocaine was first studied in the oncology community. Um, they looked at giving lidocaine infusions to cancer patients and they found that it was very successful. And so then in the post-operative world, they started using it and, and studying it also. And a Cochrane review in 2015 looked at both the oncology and the post-operative literature, and they showed that the, uh, the immediate reduction in pain that came from IV lidocaine lasted up to 24 hours. And that patients who received IV lidocaine when being treated for cancer pain or post-operatively got overall fewer opioids, equal if not better pain control, faster return to bowel movement and mobility, which of course in post-op we care about a ton, decreased length of stay in the hospital, um, less nausea and vomiting, and then very importantly, zero difference, no difference in their rate of death or arrhythmia, a lidocaine toxicity, or any other heart effects that we might be worried about with using IV lidocaine. So the conclusion from this Cochrane review was that there is moderate to, to good evidence that IV lidocaine has an impact on both pain scores compared to placebo and is safe and effective. 
So once that came out uh, in Iran, they don't have any IV NSAIDs. They don't have Tordal, Tortorolax, to treat their patients. And so they were very intrigued by this idea and wanted to know if it would work in renal colic. And so they specifically started using it uh, in their practice in renal colic. They did a couple of small case reports, led to a larger randomized control trial. And what they looked at was 0.1 mg per kilo of IV morphine, so, so an actual weight-based dosing of morphine, against 1.5 milligrams per kilo of lidocaine. Um, remember that the toxic effects of lidocaine, for those of you who are doing the math, is five per kilo. So using 1.5 milligrams per kilo is definitely much, it's very much below that five milligram per kilogram dose. Um, and so what they found is that the lidocaine compared to the IV morphine, the patients who got IV lidocaine actually did better. They, were, they scored lower on their pain scales on reevaluation, and there, again, were no difference in adverse events. So this has been proven to be very safe and effective. It's in widespread practice in Iran and increasingly in the United States as well. So the recommendation, you use 1.5 mg per kilo of lidocaine, maximum 200 milligrams. You give it over about 10 minutes on a pump. Um, and then most institutions are going to ask that you monitor the patient for 30 minutes on the cardiac monitor. Remember that sometimes our nursing and monitoring protocols are more conservative than what the data shows. So even though the data did show that it's very safe and effective, I do think that it adds a level of comfort um, if you have the patient on the cardiac monitor for 30 minutes. So usually that's what you're going to find in your institution if you're trying to get this going. So 1.5 mg per kilo of lidocaine, maximum 200 milligrams, given in like 10 minutes over a pump. Um, observe them for 30 minutes uh, on a monitor. Make sure you're still giving the Tordal and the acetaminophen. Um, and then the only contraindications here are obviously if you have a lidocaine allergy. And then next, if you have a seizure disorder, because it does lower the seizure threshold. So if somebody has a very active um, seizure disorder, I wouldn't use it. And then known cardiac disease, your AFib patients, people who've had lots of heart attacks, because even though it has been proven to be safe, we don't want to, uh, you know, tase the bear, so to speak. So if the heart is already kind of fragile, I wouldn't mess with it by giving IV lidocaine. But for your average comer who, uh, you know, young, healthy-ish person with, uh, with pretty classic length pain like the patient we discussed at the beginning, this is really safe and effective. All right. I can't um, see if there are any questions, but Jermaine, feel free if something comes up to just like wave at me and interrupt and I can stop and take questions anytime. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end. So if something comes up, feel free to put it in the chat. You're on mute, but I, I got the will do thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> great, thank you. All right, next patient and next ELSO protocol. Let's say you've got a 55 year old man. He's out in the yard working with his kids, you know, doing yard work. And then a few hours later, he feels like a pop in his back and he has really severe low back pain shooting down his left butt um, down towards the left leg. And it, it very much sounds like classic sciatica, no red flags on your history. You know, you're not worried about cancer or epidural abscess and stuff. And he's, he's got pretty bad lumbago, that low back pain going. Classically, I think we're all very familiar that people tend to think in an, in an acute back pain flare, it's very painful, that they need something like Norco. Conceptually, think about that, though. Opioids make people kind of sleepy. And what we know about backs, right, is that the best thing for them is actually movement, stretching, strengthening, um, physical therapy. And so giving people opioids is completely, like, contraindicated compared to what we want, which is get up and move and stretch. Um, and, and opioids are going to make them sleepy and want to lay in bed, which is not actually going to help that inflammatory process in the back. So first of all, we definitely want to make sure that we're educating our, our patients that like, hey, you're going to feel the worst in the morning um, because you're going to have been laying down stiff all night. And so the first thing you're going to do is get up and take the medicines we're going to talk about, but like get a hot pad, warm up those muscles and stretch. That's always going to be one of the most important things that you tell people. But because we're talking about a, an acute inflammatory process, our first line is going to be the same as it was with renal colic. A gram of acetaminophen plus either 400 to 600 milligrams of uh, ibuprofen oral, or again, you can use the 30 milligrams Tordal IM or 15 milligrams IV. Um, Post-operative and dental pain studies is really where this Tylenol plus NSAID comes from, the um, proven efficacy of those two together. And what I will mention about the ibuprofen is that 
400 milligrams. So the over-the-counter two-tablet dose, 400 milligrams of ibuprofen is the proven analgesic feeling. You're not getting any improvement um, in your pain at doses higher, the 600 and 800 milligram prescription doses. It's totally unnecessary. There is some added anti-inflammatory effect at those levels. And so sometimes in the ER, I'll give the one gram and the 600 milligram dose. But we know that at the 400 milligram dose, it's better tolerated. People have less um, GI upset, they have less GI bleeds, and they have less acute kidney injury. So if you can give the lower dose, then you should. So I'll do the higher inflammatory dose here with me in the emergency department. And then when people go home, though, I recommend just the 400 milligrams every six hours because, again, they'll have less, um, less side effects, but they'll get just as much benefit because of that analgesic feeling being at 400 milligrams. And that can be done every six or eight hours plus the gram of Tylenol um, and making sure you take them together. You don't have to separate them out. Taking them together is actually better, and it has a synergistic effect. As far as thinking about that compared to – other things that maybe you learned in residency or that you were trained on uh, in your education. So naproxen or NSAIDs with an um, opioid or NSAIDs with something, a benzodiazepine like a Valium, okay? There were two really great studies a handful of years ago in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, that looked at naproxen plus oxycodone versus naproxone, naproxen alone, and then one that was naproxen plus Valium versus naproxen alone. And what they found was that neither the opioid nor the benzodiazepine added anything. People's pain was equally as controlled with just the anti-inflammatory NSAID and no naproxen, or excuse me, and no Valium and no OxyContin. Neither were necessary. It didn't help at all. Um, so hopefully that, if nothing else, is convincing enough to you that you shouldn't, we don't need to be using um, oxycodone or, or Valium or those things. So ibuprofen, 400, plus the Tylenol, one gram. Um, you can also use naproxen 500 twice a day. This is more just a convenience. There's no difference between ibuprofen or naproxen. So you've got somebody with maybe no insurance. Um, feel free to do just over-the-counter 99-cent store ibuprofen. Very effective. But if somebody wants that naproxen prescription, they have good coverage. It is a little more convenient than the Q6 hour dosing to do that twice a day and that instead of the every six hour dose and said. Another thing that we often see people adding on here is muscle relaxers. So evidence does show that these medicines, despite being called muscle relaxers, don't relax muscles. They just relax people. They, they work on the brain to make you feel a little bit more sleepy and a little bit more chill. They don't do anything to the actual muscle. The only medication that actually relaxes muscles is septinocholine, which we use to paralyze people for intubation, and we probably wouldn't be using in a musculoskeletal layer, <laughs> I hope. Um, so the point being, they don't do anything. But remembering that pain comes in all different kinds of ways, sometimes when you have horrible back pain, like you haven't slept all night long and that makes you more tense and everything gets kind of worse and all you really want is just to like relax and take a nap, right? So in the emergency department or in the acute care setting, in the clinic, it can be reasonable to give a five milligram or 2.5 milligram oral Valium or diazepam or one of those like, you know, cyclobenzaprine, flexoril, five milligrams, whichever your uh, muscle relaxer, quote unquote, of choice is, giving a single dose of that to relax the patient, not their muscles, to relax the patient so that they can rest. So you do your, your acetaminophen plus your NSAID, add a single dose acutely of a person relaxer um, to help achieve some effects, but I would not in any circumstances be sending somebody home with a prescription for a quote muscle relaxer. They're, they're addictive, they, um, they have bad side effects that combine with other medicines to make it worse um, and make people sleepy and all the things you talked about with opioids that make them non-ideal in this setting as well. If somebody has neuropathic sounding pain, that, that pain that shoots down the leg, um, maybe the numbness and tingling in the foot, the burning pain, there is good evidence to show that a single dose of gabapentin can be safe and effective. Um, anything between 300 and 600 milligrams, one-time dose in the emergency department or in your clinic. Um, remember that when you start people on a prescription for gabapentin, it has to be titrated up. Usually it's like three or four days of 300 milligrams at night, and they kind of go to twice a day dosing, et cetera. But that really ought to be done either in the inpatient setting or by a primary care physician. Um, or clinician, I should say, and not by an emergency medicine provider. So if you work in an urgent care or an ER, 
Uh, feel free to give the one-time dose. It can help with that neuropathic pain, but I wouldn't, again, recommend prescribing it unless you know this person has really good follow-up and is going to be able to titrate it appropriately. Speaking of neuropathic pain, opioids actually are known to aggravate nerves, and so yet another reason why they're not great uh, in the setting of like lumbago, low back pain, or sciatica. We often think about uh, injections or pills, but we forget that with things like musculoskeletal pain, the skin is a really effective way to get medications on board as well. So there are multiple options for this, one of which is diclofenac gel. It's actually an NSAID topical agent. There's a gel or there's a cream. Um, and why that's really helpful is that some of our patients can't have NSAIDs, right? Maybe they have bad renal disease or they're already on dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin, Plavix, and you don't want to be adding another antiplatelet agent like ibuprofen on there. Using a topical agent is not systemically absorbed. So that's one way that you can get some anti-inflammatory directly into that location without systemic uh, negative side effects, which is helpful. You can also use lidocaine patches or lidocaine creams or gels. These are extremely effective. Patients really like them. You can put between one and three of them on there, depending on how big the space is that's bothering people. Um, the 4% patches, which sometimes are like 3.6%, uh, but the, so they're estimated at 4% patches are over the counter and they're really inexpensive. They're like a couple of dollars per patch. You can buy a box of them for maybe $10. So again, thinking about patients that don't have insurance coverage, this is a good option. The one thing people will say about them is they don't stick on very well. So the 5% ones have a nicer adhesive and they tend to not peel off as easily. So you might want to send patients home with like a roll of the, you know, paper tape or something or just advise them, hey, they do peel off easily. So think about putting, you know, something on there to help it stick. But studies have shown that the 3.6 slash 4% one compared to the prescription 5% one have no difference in added pain control. They work about the same. There are also some patches out there that have menthol in them, also no added benefit, but some people just like that coolness feeling, but they all work the same. So thinking about what uh, coverage the patient has can be helpful. I'm gonna skip over this for right now. We will talk about ketamine in just a minute, but file away that ketamine for pain is also a good option in some of these patients. And then maybe my very favorite thing to do uh, in the setting of acute back pain is a trigger point injection. Um, this is actually done as dry needling in like physical therapy in some states, not California, and done a lot by physiotherapists or physiatrists, PM&R doctors. Um, and it needs to become more common in medicine. I know uh, Dr. Lee and I both love this, love this move. And it's based on this idea that, you know, along our neck and our upper back, we have all these spots where you can get what's called a trigger point or a tight muscle knot. And when we think about, say, abscesses, right, we know that in an abscess, there's all this pus in there and there's no good blood flow. So if somebody takes antibiotics, takes antibiotics, the blood flow is not going to take the antibiotic into that pus ball. So what do you have to do? You got to cut it out and take the pus out for it to get better. In a trigger point, in a really tightly wound ball of muscle fibers that is just clenched down and become angry, there's no blood flow in there either. And so taking Tylenol, taking ibuprofen, even a topical agent, not going to penetrate into that area. And so what you have to do, similar to an abscess, is physically get in there and mechanically disrupt these really tight, agitated muscle, uh, muscle balls. And so basically, that's, that's just kind of the concept. It's very, very simple. You need very few things. This is it. A little lidocaine that you drop into a small syringe, um, a skinny needle, like a 25, 27, it's fine. Um, in the back, you can use a little bit longer of a needle, but up in the neck, I recommend using a, a shorter one just because you don't want to be going too deep. We have a little bit more critical structures up in the neck and then a Band-Aid. And what you do is you, you run your finger kind of down people's backs uh, or their necks and you find the spot that when you hit that bump, you can feel it, but also the patient goes, ugh and kind of winces and pulls away from you, like, that's the spot, you know, that they walk in, they can't move their neck, you hit their point, and they're like, ooh, doc, that's, you know, that's the one. That's the spot. So you're going to clean that with your alcohol pad. Then you're going to take your fingers and kind of straddle that big knot. So you feel that muscle knot, you straddle the knot to hold it still. You're going to take the lidocaine and make a wheel, just numb the skin like you would anything you're about to inject or, or cut or whatever in any procedure we do in medicine. So a little bit of that. And really importantly, that's, that's pretty much the end of the, um, of the actual injection part. The injection is the lidocaine to numb the skin for you to then do the dry needling. 
So then you're going to take that needle. You're going to put it straight down into that ball. You're going to pull it back most of the way, re-angle, go in again, pull back, re-angle, go in again. And you're kind of making like a star trying to get into each of the pockets of this really angry muscle knot. The classic like path and mnemonic finding for if you're doing it right is that sometimes you will actually visualize that muscle knot go and like jolt and then relax. When that happens, it's super cool, but it's not necessary. Uh, if you don't see it, it doesn't mean you're not doing it right. But if you do see it, don't be shocked. It actually like shows that you kind of hit that hit that muscle, it spasmed out, it relaxed itself, and then it will calm down. So you, you inject a little lidocaine in with the needle, pull back, re-angle, go in, pull back, re-angle, go in. You just kind of go all these different angles, maybe for 30 different seconds, pull it out, pop a Band-Aid on it. And as Dr. Alexis Lapietra told me when she taught me this, and then she ended up being totally right, um, people will hug you. Like 100%, people will get up off the chair and cry and hug you, and it works within like 30 seconds to a minute. Um, sometimes if you've got a really good trigger point at triage, it's a 30-second procedure. You just kind of, oh, I found the trigger point, boom, boom, let me get your discharge paperwork ready, and by the time it's done, this person's ready to go home. It's extremely, extremely effective. Um, and it's safe, right? Think about like you're not really giving any serious medicines to anybody, which is nice. So don't forget that after the trigger point, you still want to do the rest of the stuff on here, especially the Tylenol, the ibuprofen. If they really haven't slept, maybe they need a one-time dose of a person relaxer medicine like we talked about, stretching, massage, you know, rubbing it, making it warm, all of that stuff. It's still an inflammatory process, and it still needs support, but that trigger point can be exceptionally effective. So then let's say this doesn't work. You do all this, a trigger point, all the medicines, you rub it in, they take a volume, they take a nap, they wake up, and it's still a 10 out of 10, horrible pain. Or the person is already on opioids. There's somebody who says, I have chronic back pain. I take Norco for my back pain, you know, every day. Um, it's not working for me today. Um, this is what we normally then will see a provider say, well, might as well get the opioids on this person, right? There's no winning, they're already on Norco, let's do it. When in fact, 100% the opposite is true. They're already taking an opioid. So their mu receptor, the opioid receptor, is already occupied. So throwing extra morphine or fentanyl or Dilaudid at a patient who's already on oral opioids and has been trying them at home, all you're actually doing is increasing the circulating amounts of opioid in their body, which makes them feel fake better because their head thinks they feel better because they're getting a lot more of the side effects of opioids, the sleepiness, the relaxation, um, you know, the more somnolence, there's more risk of respiratory depression, but you're not actually fixing the problem. All you're doing is increasing um, the, the level of circulating opioid in there. For a flare up, it's acute inflammation on their chronic problem. And so it turns out that the first treatment is all the things that we already mentioned. And so even if a patient tells you, doctor, that does not work for me. Tylenol doesn't work for me. I can't believe you're going to give me Tylenol or ibuprofen. This is where that conversation becomes really important, right? Hey, I hear you, but you're already taking Norco at home and it's not working for you. Our body has lots of different receptors. It sounds like you're having a flare up of your pain and I want to help take that flare down. I want to help break that cycle, break that crisis of inflammation that your back or that your body is experiencing. And so remember, if they have that neuropathic pain, you can add that gabapentin, make sure you're doing all your topical stuff, um, think about doing a uh, toradol injection, intramuscular IV, because there is, I think, you know, at least psychologically, some satisfaction that comes when you're somebody who has chronic pain with getting an injection medication. Um, but all those are still the right thing. And then if none of that works, this is like the best opportunity for trying ketamine because the NMDA receptor that ketamine works on is wide open. We have not mentioned a single agent so far that works on the NMDA receptor. So it's like right there and uh, right for you to use it. And this is going to be using what's a, a subdissociative or an analgesic or pain dose ketamine. Ketamine is a really interesting medication because its pharmacokinetics are such that at different weight-based dosing, it works pretty differently. At the higher doses, the two milligrams per kilogram IV or four milligrams per kilogram intramuscular dosing, that's our sedation dose. That's like fully dissociative. You know, you're going to put somebody's fracture back in place. Like that's what you're using. We are currently talking about 0 0.1 
to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, like 20 times or whatever, 200 times less um, medication. And that's an, an IV dose up to about 30 milligrams. And this dose does not cause dissociation or sedation. It's actually really good at controlling pain. Um, whereas again, that two milligram version is much more like full sedated dissociation. The middle ground though, if you were to go like 0.5, uh, 0.7, that's what we like to call the K-hole. And you should stay out of the K-hole. That is where recreational dose ketamine exists. A lot of bad things happen to people um, psychologically uh, in, in that that realm, you know, they get very agitated. It's kind of like being on cocaine in some ways. It's a stimulant, an illicit stimulant in that range. So your key is that you're either doing full-blown sedation at two per kilo IV, or you're staying in the 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 milligrams IV with a maximum of 30 for those pain-based dosing. Um, so you're going to give that dose uh, in about 50 cc's of normal saline over 10 minutes, or you can just give the higher end the 0.3 mg per kilo intramuscular. And you can repeat the dose after one hour um, if it's very effective and then, um, you know, kind of wears off, but it's effective again and it wears off and the patient just needs more time. You can run it as a drip, actually. Um, that's harder to do outside of the ER just because of uh, nursing comfort and hospital protocols and those kinds of things. But it is an option for you in the emergency department. And since what your goal is um, at that time is to break crisis, sometimes like one or two hours on the ketamine drip, their pain might now get to a, a point where they can deal with more like push dose, um, just anti-inflammatories and topical agents, et cetera. And you might actually decrease the length of stay and save an admission or decrease opioids anyway. So considering the dose um, as a drip for a little while is, is a good option as well. Ketamine is again out of your system in about 30 or 45 minutes. That's why the one hour repeat is, a, is the right window. Side effects for this drug. People do feel a little bit um, not so much altered as they say altered sensorium, like they have kind of an out of body experience. They'll say like, I feel kind of funny, but they're fully oriented and awake and talking to and breathing. They might just feel a little bit off, not the same as that full dissociation with the sedation based dosing. And unlike full sedation ketamine, we talk about that emergence phenomenon that is not seen at these lower doses. So the literature is very supportive that you don't even need a monitor. There's no need for a cardiac monitor. You really could give this um, intranasal, 50 milligrams intranasal, and put somebody in the lobby, and it would be very safe. It's harder to do that if you haven't um, trained your nursing staff as well to be comfortable and to, and to really understand and, and be comfortable with ketamine, um, but it is technically medically safe. But the take home here really is just that having ketamine up your sleeve as another tool in your toolbox um, is a really good one because it's, it's going to act on that NMDA receptor that we haven't even talked about yet. And it's an important part of having a full multimodal approach for patients who have more complex or chronic pain. And it is effective and it is easy to use and it is really safe. Other options. Um, dexamethasone in some settings does have some um, anti-inflammatory and pain-related properties. I do want to take a beat, though, and clarify that I'm not advocating to give steroids in general. So there are a lot of studies um, that show that, like, the Medrol dose pack, the Slime Medrol, is not actually effective. Um, again, people have anecdotal evidence the other way, but the true data shows that giving steroids in acute back pain is not helpful. A single dose of dexamethasone, however, because dex has um, analgesic effects as well, the way that it works, is an effective option, but not for the steroid component. You're using it as an anti-pain medication in that setting. Um, remembering that, again, like for diazepam, IV, and psychobenzaprine and other things, not good for a prescription, but might be good to help your patient get some sleep in the emergency department. Overall picture, Tylenol, NSAIDs, topical agents like lidocaine or diclofenac, a trigger point injection, patches, and if that fails, consider ketamine. Um, you can add gabapentin for neuropathic pain, maybe a single dose of a person relaxer uh, or a benzodiazepine, no prescriptions for that, and really you just, there isn't a situation where you should be using opioids in this setting. They're not all this long, but the ketamine and the lidocaine took a lot of explaining, so here we go. Next patient, maybe it's a 35-year-old female, you know, she comes into the ER a lot. She has this chronic abdominal pain that's been studied by all kinds of specialists. No one can really figure out what it is. Some say IBS or gastroparesis or whatever. Um, and she's in today with just 
vomiting and horrible diffuse belly pain, just like her normal chronic belly pain flare up. But she feels terrible and she looks dehydrated and she's crying and she's miserable. Um, I know that you've seen patients like this. We all do on almost every shift. As you know by now, opioids are not recommended for chronic pain. In general, patients build tolerance, so they constantly need a higher dose, which means they're at higher risk of side effects, and then they need a higher dose after that, and so on and so forth. And then they begin to struggle with the side effects of opioids, like slowing down the gut and constipation, um, fall from um, altered sensorium, those kinds of things. And ultimately, they're not actually experiencing relief of the cause of their pain, they're just using it to make their brain think that they feel better. But you know that and I know that. And so with flare-ups of acute on chronic pain, the first thing that we must do is expectation set with our patients. And this needs to come from a place that is very um, compassionate but honest because while chronic pain is absolutely terrible and very distressing, I mean, I, I look at these patients and I think I, I wouldn't want that. At the same time, it's not realistic for them to expect to suddenly have us either A, find the answer for why they're having chronic pain, or B, get them to be free of pain in that moment. They've had chronic pain for weeks or months or years. Like my one day in the clinic or in the ER isn't going to change that. And so we need to start to develop, develop language, things like saying, you know, we're trying to get you today to a functional level. We want to break crisis. I can tell that you have chronic pain. I'm not going to make it go all the way away, but you're in a crisis. I'm trying to help you break that crisis so that you can go home and walk around and eat and sleep tonight, I'll get to the bathroom, those kinds of things, despite the pain that you're having. Um, and it's just really important to realize that you need to talk about this openly in any instance of, of acute on chronic pain or chronic pain in general. So in my experience, I feel like the most common type of chronic pain really is abdominal pain. Yes, back to, but we see so much chronic abdominal pain because I do think belly pain is a, you know, a manifestation of lots of different things people go through, psychological, social, emotional, and physical. So there are lots of reasons why people have pain, but the general approach is going to start the same. I know you're shocked by this at this point, but we're going to start with a gram of acetaminophen and an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen, 400 milligrams is that analgesic feeling, or Ketorolac, Toradol, 30 milligrams IM, 15 milligrams, or even 10 milligrams IV. And then as with the musculoskeletal, if there is a neuropathic sounding component, you can try that, that single dose of gabapentin, 300 or 600 milligrams, one time in the ER, discussing the, if it works, discussing a longer term dose with their primary care provider, or if you are the primary care provider, thinking about starting them on gabapentin. Other considerations though, so metoclopramide or Reglan um, is a prokinetic agent. So if somebody feels like um, they have slow emptying, this is like your diabetic, your gastroparesis, um, the Reglan is known to stimulate peristalsis. So that's a good, that's a good time to pick your Reglan. It's a prokinetic agent. Compare that on the flip side to dicyclamine, which is usually called Bentol. It's the most common brand name, Bentol. Bentol is an irritable bowel medication that does quite the opposite. It actually reduces cramping by slowing down the natural movements of our gut um, and relaxing the smooth muscles in our stomach and in our intestines. So if somebody has a lot of cramping or they're having diarrhea, Bentol might be a good option. If somebody is having a lot of constipation or um, they feel like nothing is moving or that you're listening to their bowel sounds and everything's kind of slow, almost like an ileus, um, then Reglan might be the better option for that patient. Compazine or prochlorperazine uh, is another one to consider because it's a good nausea vomiting medication, but it's also indicated for the treatment of anxiety. And absolutely, you bet your bottom dollar, people with chronic pain have some depression and anxiety. Who wouldn't? It's a horrible thing to live with chronic pain. So the beautiful thing about Compazine is that it's also kind of treating the non nociceptive source of their pain while also taking care of nausea and vomiting. So it's a great option um, in this setting as well. If those are unsuccessful, again, you can turn to ketamine, like we discussed, lidocaine, same as in, uh, in renal colic, 1.5 mg per kilo, run over 10 minutes on a pump, maximum 200 milligrams. Um, but another thing that you can do is Haldol or Haloperidol, 2.5 milligrams intramuscular or IV. A lot of places will make you have someone on the cardiac monitor or do an EKG first if you're going to do IV, so it's often just much easier to do it intramuscular. Um, but this is, again, thinking about treating, oops, 
those non-nociceptive sources of pain. Another little population to mention separately would be those hyperemesis cannabis patients. So if somebody has a lot of marijuana um, use, first of all, educate them about it. Tell them about it. Say, hey, I think this might be related to your marijuana. I'm sure you don't believe me. I understand it sounds kind of weird. Do me a favor. I want you to look it up on your phone. It's called hyperemesis cannabis or uh, cannabis, you know, cyclic vomiting syndrome. Look it up and read about it. I'm still going to do the test I'm going to do and treat you with the medicine to make you feel better, but I want to talk about it later. And then that way they read about it, they think about it, um, and Haldol really is the first-line treatment in that instance, and it can be very effective. Also, topical capsaicin cream, um, but be careful because that one burns the hands of the person putting it on, so we always recommend that you use gloves, but that can be really effective also. Okay, also protocol number four, migraine. How often do we see patients with horrible tension headaches or migraines? They're often vomiting. It's been going on for days. They feel miserable. Again, really importantly, we're talking about like no red flags. You don't think it's a brain tumor or meningitis, but someone's having a multiple day gradual onset, not thunderclap, um, but maybe horrible looking migraine. What do we do? Well, in general, as with a lot of these other protocols, opioids are known to be a bad choice in headache because whenever we study them, what we see is that for patients who have migraines, if they are on opioids or given opioids in the ER, they miss more days of work. Um, there's increases general life disability, like not being able to do your normal daily tasks at home. It's associated with increased rates of depression and anxiety if you're on opioids for headaches. Um, and then it also leads known, it's known to lead to bounce back headaches and more severe migraines. So there's a higher um, chance for 72 hour bounce back. If you have a migraine or a tension style headache in the ER, you get opioids, you go home. Those patients are known to bounce back more frequently than if we don't give opioids. So opioids are generally not recommended at all for people who are having an acute headache, um, again, in the absence of like a head bleed and trauma and those kinds of things. But if it sounds like tension headache or migraine, we should be reaching for these other things first. And the first line is going to be what we like to call the headache cocktail. A lot of people have their own sort of nuance on this, but it usually involves an IV fluid bolus because they've had this headache for multiple days. We know that even mild dehydration exacerbates headaches. It's unlikely this person's been taking really good, you know, PO while they've been really sick and vomiting and lying in bed with a headache. So we give some fluid hydration, starting with a gram of Tylenol and your NSAID of choice. Again, this should always be your, your go-to. It's pretty safe in almost every condition. Then you're going to add, again, your anti-emetic du jour, whichever one you like, whether it's Reguan or Copazine or Zofran or something. Um, and then we add an antihistamine. So usually that's going to be diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Uh, the sleeping component that comes with that is helpful too. A lot of people prefer to use Phenergan or Promethazine. There is really no benefit one versus the other, but we add an antihistamine um, because those are also thought to do a little bit to relax the smooth muscle um, around people's uh, temples, and that can kind of help with that throbbing pain as well. So you start there with your headache cocktail. And if the patient has not had uh, a significant increase of, or decrease in their pain, there are other options. Um, and additionally, thinking about what kind of pain they have. So if it is one-sided and throbbing in the front, you can consider what's called a phenopalatine ganglion block, which is where you can do this as a Q-tip. I don't recommend it. Instead, you should just use an atomizer and inject the lidocaine. But there in the back of our nose, there is a phenopalatine ganglion, a collection of nerves that are both parasympathetically and autonomically innervated. And the theory is that migraines might be a result of some autonomic dysregulation. And you can use lidocaine to anesthetize this ganglion to help stop that headache cycle and then kick that migraine as a, as a subsequent consequence. So what you do is you put a half a cc or a 4% lidocaine or one cc of 2% lidocaine. You split it in between the nostrils. You use the atomizer. You spray it in the one side. You spray it in the other side straight back to anesthetize that ganglion. And if somebody has a very classic frontal one-sided headache and you hit the ganglion on that side, it can be extremely effective. Similarly, if they're having a really bad occipital headache, consider doing a trigger point injection if they've got like cervical paraspinal muscle knot involvement. Um, so thinking again about the physical treatments of pain and not just the medication. There are great videos of how to do both trigger points and this phenopalatine block on a website called Academic Life in Emergency Medicine, or ALIEM, A-L-I-E-M.com. Um, so look for A-L-I-E-M, and then put uh, the 
uh, the name of it says between the palatine ganglia block, and you should be able to find that without too much trouble. But if after you've tried your headache cocktail, and then maybe you try the, the ganglion block or, or the trigger point, nothing works, the next line would be to try a gram of magnesium um, IV over 60 minutes. You can also give two grams depending on uh, if that's just what you have available. I know at our ER we have two grams available in that one. So one or two grams is, is a moot point. That is known to be a smooth muscle relaxer. You can also give dexamethasone between 4 and 10 milligrams IV. This is not only, as mentioned before, an analgesic or a pain medication, but in some studies it's been shown to decrease 72-hour bounce back in headaches specifically. That can be really helpful. If that doesn't work, so now you've done your headache cocktail, didn't get it less than 50%, so then you did, you know, your magnesium and maybe some dexamethasone, didn't get it down less than 50%. The next thing you could try is Haldol, again, going for those non-nociceptive um, components of pain, or valproic acid. A lot of neurologists use um, valproic acid as a chronic migraine suppressant in patients who have really horrible, intractable, difficult to treat migraines in the outpatient setting. And there's some evidence that shows that it's pretty safe and easy to use in the ER or the acute setting also. So you can get 500 milligrams in 50 milligrams of um, saline over about 20 minutes. And that's been pretty safe and effective too. At that point, if you've done everything on this screen and it's not working, and you're gonna to turn to opioids, which you should if you've exhausted all these measures. This though is the time where you're gonna be admitting for a neurology consult, because that would be a really high level migraine. That it, so if you have ever exhausted your options and you're getting to opioids, you should be thinking about admitting the person, the person or calling neurology for a consult. That's how far down the list opioids should be, uh, particularly in an acute tension headache or a migraine style setting. We're not going to go into this one in detail, but it's more just a concept to think about that there are a lot of times where we need really good pain control for things, big abscesses, or to take a foreign body out of somebody's ear, or a really big deep laceration that can take like, you know, 100 cc's of lidocaine to numb up, um, or in a little kid. And so oftentimes we find ourselves having to do a full-blown sedation or use higher levels of, of opioids for those things. And instead, the ALTO concepts would say, think about a handful of other things, all the meds that we've mentioned so far, but also these two specifically, which are nitrous oxide and ultrasound-guided regional blocks. Nitrous oxide is usually a mix of 50-50, um, but it can also be 70-30, nitrous to oxygen. Um, it is known for being taken out of all the ERs so people used to abuse it because it makes you feel really good while you're using it. Um, but it's kind of coming back with uh, better controls. It used to just be straight out of the wall. Now it's usually like in a lost cart that, that you can get. It's very safe. Um, you have to have a mask held up to your face, and so patients will hold it. And then when the patient kind of passes out, their hand will fall away, and they'll wake up, and they can put the mask right back on. So the patient can be involved. There's a like, safety measure in there, which is really nice. Um, it's used a lot in endoscopy. It's used in labor and delivery. There are a lot of places where this is still being used a lot in medicine, and we might consider trying to bring it back in the acute care um, setting as well. You don't need an IV, which is awesome. You might want to use a pulse ox, but the dentists don't use it until when they're doing it, and it's, it's everybody's fine. Nobody ever dies from nitrous oxide. Um, related hypoxia, so you probably don't even need that, honestly. Um, and the person can go home with no restrictions. The, the nitrous is fully out of your system in 60 seconds after you take the mask away. So there's no like observation time. They don't have to be on a one-to-one -one nursing after that. You know, there's no big handout that says you were sedated today, all that stuff, so it's very safe. There are some contraindications and downsides. People who are claustrophobic probably aren't gonna wanna have a mask. We don't recommend it if you have lung disease like COPD or asthma. Um, we don't recommend it for anybody with chronic sinus or inner ear problems because there's concern that um, small air bubbles might get trapped in there, which would not be good for these patients. Um, and it's not recommended for first or second trimester pregnancy. It is um, safe in third trimester, but earlier on, there's a slight risk in increasing miscarriage um, and some infertility. So we don't, uh, we don't like that. We also wouldn't use it for altered or acute psychiatric patients, which feels a little bit more um, obvious to me. But the fast take home is just, it's really safe, it's very effective. The key is just making sure that you have it available. And then again, about ultrasound guided blocks, there are so many ways to do these. There are lots of videos, that's a whole lecture or day uh, in and of itself, but 
Um, if your team at your acute care setting is not doing regional blocks, it's something I would highly encourage you to look into and get educated on because it can be a super effective way to, uh, to reduce pain for people that last a lot longer than their length of time in your ER and decreases the opioid use overall, which is great. So to recap, these are the main protocols. We covered a ton of different medications that get used here. And one onus on us as providers is that it is important for us to make sure we do know the correct populations, the side effects, the right dosing, all those things. So this is meant to be a slide you can kind of take a picture of and keep on your phone for if you're trying to look things up in the future. And then I would be remiss if I didn't spend a brief moment just giving a nod to the fact that I am also a big supporter of non-medication related pain control heat, cold, elevation, stretching, massage, even distraction, like when we get little kids to watch their YouTube video while we fix something, right? Like it really does work. And so there are um, some emergency departments that have incorporated things like this little finger labyrinth printout for people who are, um, who are open to trying it. And so we just need to remember that pain is a really complex process. It's not just physical. And there are lots of ways to treat it that aren't medication too. So I've definitely talked long enough for now, and I'm gonna hand over uh, to Dr. Lee to talk about pain management for patients who are on buprenorphine. Hi, thanks, Alicia. Yeah, so I am really just gonna talk about a patient that I had in clinic, and that will be our case study, and really kind of just go through what do you do, um, mostly on the inpatient side. So I had a patient who was on buprenorphine for both opioid use disorder and for chronic pain. And I talked to her in clinic and I said, hey, do you just wanna get another knee replacement for your right knee, just like you did, cause it helped you a lot for your left knee. And she balked, she was like, no, 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 there's no way I'm going through that again. And the reason why was because when she had gotten her first surgery a few years ago, they had st completely stopped her buprenorphine. She went into withdrawals, her pain wasn't controlled, and then she had a really hard time getting back on the buprenorphine. And so she was willing to forego the surgery that would increase her mobility, decrease her pain, and that she knew worked because she was really terrified about the mismanagement of her buprenorphine. So I already kind of gave the little punchline for what do you do with her buprenorphine and how do you manage her pain post-op, but we're gonna go into a little bit more detail. But first, before we do that, um, we can have this up, but like I realized that we didn't um, include a slide about health disparities. And I wanted to just talk about that really quickly because it's so, so important. Um, as we are in this COVID pandemic and in this opioid epidemic, we are seeing worse outcomes in non-white minorities. And this is not just in addiction medicine. This is not just in pain. It's in all of medicine. But the key points are that in regards to pain medications, we tend to prescribe less pain medications to non-white minorities. So we are under treating their pain. And we also prescribe less buprenorphine for um, OUD management for people of color. So I just wanna throw that out there just so that we are aware and so that when you're out there practicing, you pause and stop and think about, am I changing my management for this person based off of gender, sexuality, um, race, ethnicity, or is this how I would treat it? Do I have a good reason for not giving them opioids? Do I have a good reason for um, not giving them buprenorphine? And to really just kind of think about it. Same thing also goes for um, treatment for acute overdoses in the ED. There was a big randomized control trial that showed that we are less likely to give reversal agents for acute um, toxicities for non-white minorities. And not by small percentages, but by like 48% um, less odds of getting treatment. So I put that out there because I think it's really important to talk about and to think about. But now we'll just talk a little bit about what we do with our patients who are on buprenorphine or really on methadone that come into the hospital with acute pain. So like Alicia was talking about, um, it's not about this one medication that's gonna solve everything. It's really about, let's see what we have in our toolbox and let's figure out what we can use and let's try a whole bunch of different um, methods in order to treat your acute on chronic pain or just acute pain. 
This is our uh, algorithm for acute pain management for the med surge units. We have another algorithm that has a little bit more details on the dosing that's geared more towards critical care and for the emergency department. But there are things on it that we don't use as hospitalists, like um, the dosing for IV lidocaine and ketamine, because most hospitals don't let us do that. But if you were interested and you are in critical care or in the ED, um, feel free to look at our other algorithm. So if we break this down, um, the first thing is if someone comes in on maintenance butte, that is not enough to treat their acute pain episode. Same thing with methadone. So I never take it away. I always continue it. You can split their dosing from just once daily to something like TID or QID to help a little bit more with the analgesic effects, but I never take it away. Part of it is because it will, one, it will help with their OUD and their cravings. It will help reduce their anxiety for, by it from take, being taken away. And it will also help a little bit with analgesia at a baseline. And what Alicia talked about, the biggest thing that I say is promoting calm and comfort and a little bit of verbicane. Um, when my clinic patient told me that, hey, I don't wanna get a surgery because I don't know what the surgeons are gonna do. I told her, hey, let's put in a referral. Once you decide, or if you decide you want surgery, have your surgeon call me or I will call your surgeon and we'll think of a game plan to make sure that your pain is controlled while you are in the hospital. So that just like having game plan decreases anxiety, decreases the fear. Um, and it really just allows patients to hear, oh, you're listening to me, you care about me. Uh, like Alicia was also saying, I utilize around the clock acetaminophen and NSAIDs as much as possible. And I always get patients who say, but doc, come on, like acetaminophen's not gonna do anything for me. Like this isn't gonna work. And I tell them I'm like, yeah, I understand this isn't the only thing we're doing. What we are doing is we're controlling your pain at a foundation, at a baseline, so you use less opioids. So we can control it so you don't get these highs and lows. And so as long as there's no contraindications, I'll max out acetaminophen and NSAIDs in the acute setting. And then we move further down. And so I started thinking about non opioid analgesics, um, particularly if people have diabetes and they have a lot of neuropathic pain, I'll throw on some gabapentin. Um, there's a lot of coexisting anxiety and depression. And so if I they have a PCP and I know that they're gonna follow up, I'll actually start an SNRI or a TCA within the hospital in the inpatient side, because one, it takes a long time for these medications to work. You have to titrate it up. And if I started on the inpatient, um, I think that patients are a little bit more likely to continue taking it. And this might be something that their primary care provider hadn't really thought about and can continue on for them. Oftentimes I'll ask um, my anesthesia colleagues to come and do a regional block if um, that is appropriate. And this isn't specific for pregnancy, but it's similar to what uh, Alicia had talked about with the nitrous, like we utilize nitrous, you can use spinals, um, you can use the epidural, all of that. We list the lidocaine, ketamine, and magnesium on there as options, um, but we tend to use them a little bit less. Now, after you've used all your non-opioids, you can think about additional opioids. If they are on buprenorphine, but at a, kind of on the lower end of the dose, say they're only on 60 milligrams a day, you can always increase it in the short term. So I will go up to probably about like 32 milligrams and I'll split the dosing. Sometimes on the higher end, people feel a little bit more um, jittery, a little bit more anxious. So I caution on that. And if they're not tolerating the higher dose, I'll bring them back down. Um, but it's okay to increase your buprenorphine because there's that ceiling effect on respiratory depression. Now say they had this big surgery or they had a fracture and they're on their buprenorphine, but it's not cutting it. It is okay to throw on full agonists if you need it. So they did studies on C-sections and on joint replacements, and they found that people who were on maintenance buprenorphine and maintenance methadone needed higher doses of full opioid agonists, which was likely thought to be tolerance, but they, their pain was well controlled as if you compared to people who were not on the maintenance bup or maintenance methadone. 
and there was no increase in morbidity or mortality. So there was no increase in respiratory depression. There are no increases in overdoses. So you can use full opioid agonists on top of it if you need to. And doing this will not precipitate withdrawal. And then I think the next slide is a little bit about pregnancy. Oh, no, nope, it's just a summary slide. So basically continue the maintenance buprenorphine, use multimodal analgesia like we've been talking about the whole time, okay to add full opioid agonists and need higher doses. So I also talk about not being afraid to treat the pain because there's this very common myth in the medical community that I don't wanna give this patient opioids because they have an opioid use disorder or their meth use disorder and giving them opioids is gonna trigger them into a relapse or trigger them back to use. But what we have really found is that the biggest trigger for relapse or return to use is untreated or uncontrolled pain. It's not giving them opioids for acute pain episodes. And so I always make sure, and this is what our patients have experienced as well. So I always make sure to tell them, we will treat you for your pain. We will not underdose you for your pain. And it also, once you listen to patients and actually tell them that, you also increase the therapeutic alliance, not just with the patient, but also with the nursing staff as well. And it kind of just like eases the tension like for the rest of the visit. And the next one's about pregnancy. And <laughs> essentially it's the same. Like they're like, this is a spoiler, it's essentially the same. We do the same things. We continue their maintenance dosing. We use our multimodal modal analgesia. The NSAIDs are only postpartum. Um, we do avoid the statal and the nubane um, because that can precipitate withdrawal if someone is on uh, buprenorphine or on methadone, but that's really like the only big difference that we do. And um, I just wanna say the key point is to not be afraid to treat the pain. And we have a lot of tools in our toolbox. Thank you, Sky. We're almost to the end here. And I'm, I mean, of course, we're so happy to take all your questions. Um, but just another word about patient education. So you heard both Sky and me say over and over and over, this thing about like, and you have to talk to your patient, you talk to your patient. Because when we think about a lot of different medical ailments, like diabetes, okay? Someone has diabetes and we put them on insulin. We don't just say, hey, here's your prescription for insulin, have a nice day. No, there's like a diabetes educator and somebody who comes and talks to you about your diet and somebody who teaches you how to do insulin and the nurses do all this teaching. There's like a ton of information about you know, dangers of going too low in your blood sugar, dangers of being too high, how to use your medicine correctly. Same thing with, you know, new onset AFib, where you had a stroke, and now you're going to be on a blood thinner. We talk about safe dosing, how to monitor it, how to, you know, make sure you don't fall down because this could happen to you, blah, 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 blah. Like, we do all this education, and then when it comes to pain, we just sort of say, here's your prescription, bye. And that's not going to fly, right? Like all medications have side effects. And especially if we're going to be using opioids, we need to talk about it. The risk of addiction, the importance of using that as your breakthrough medication and not just your, your baseline pain. You're going to start with the acetaminophen and, and the ibuprofen. And then you're going to go to Norco if you can't sleep at night. Um, talking to people about the potential for overdose, about having naloxone, co-prescribing it for them, and then having naloxone on the home and available on the off chance somebody does accidentally um, overdose. So there's a lot of education that we need to do better with our patients. And when we talk about chronic pain, sort of as I mentioned before, there are phrases that all of us should practice and get better at saying. And not just saying them to say them, but meaning them. So things like, I just wanna be honest, like we're not gonna get your pain to zero today. However, I can tell that you are in a pain crisis. And so my goal is to get you from intolerable pain to a tolerable amount of pain, a pain that allows you to still be functional um, and go about your day, but it's probably not going to be a zero. And I just want to be honest about that from the beginning. Or if somebody gets hurt, right? They have a broken bone. They say, but it hurts. You're only sending me home with three days of narco, but it hurts. And you say, I, I understand that it hurts. You broke your bone, you know, like the body needs time to heal and pain is a natural part of that process. And you might have some pain for, even a long time, and that is okay. Some pain is okay. Our goal is to keep you at a functional level 
um, so that it doesn't distract you from, again, sleeping and, and watching TV and hanging out with your family, but it's not necessarily, the goal is not pain-free, which I think we can all acknowledge is, is an adjustment compared to what we as doctors used to tell patients even in the 60s where we said, oh, nobody should ever have pain ever. Here's your perk set. We've got to move away from that. Um, and then finally, when you're having a difficult time with patients um, who are really pressing you for opioids, being comfortable saying, you know, my job is to keep you safe. And while I realize that opioids, your Norco, your Percocet, your Oxy, your Dilaudid might make you feel better if we were to do that now, in the long run, they're not safe or effective. They're actually really dangerous, and they're not going to work for you over time um, and increase the side effect and your, your risk of long-term bad consequences and dying. And I'm just not willing to do something that I know isn't safe. I'd rather focus on developing a really safe plan that can control your pain um, and keep it tolerable and isn't going to hurt you over time. And you just kind of have to practice saying these to yourself and, and to the patient and be honest, um, again, especially with those chronic pain patients. And speaking of that conversation at time for discharge, sometimes this is going to include opioids. Like we are going to send people home with an opioid prescription sometimes, and that's okay. But we have to be really uniform um, as a medical community about what that means. So this is the California ASEP example of what a lot of different organizations have put out their own version of. But this idea of having prescriber guidelines um, that you as a system would, might have this printed somewhere on your discharge packets or something that you can hand a patient if it's relevant, where all of your providers are sticking by the same rules. And usually the common themes are things like, most opioid prescriptions or all of them should only come from one provider per patient. So if you're here in my ER, you have chronic pain, you'd like a Norco refill, I can't do that actually. Like your doctor is the one who writes your Norco, not me. And if I look in the database, I have the California Registry of Cures, I and mean, I see 20 different names, that's, that's the way that you kind of facilitate that conversation. Like, look, this isn't safe. You want only one person to be watching over your pain control so that it's better quality and safety of your care. We don't replace lost or stolen pain medications. That's a, a policy that you could adapt in your, in your ER or your clinic. Um, we don't write for long-acting or controlled release opioids like fentanyl patches from the ER, period. We don't write methadone prescriptions, period. Um, use, again, the CURES database whenever it's, it's relevant. And if somebody is having an acute on chronic pain exacerbation and they burn through their pills too fast, your goal is if you're going to refill it at all, to cover only the minimum number of days until they can get back to their primary care provider. So we shouldn't be writing more than three days worth of opioids from the acute care setting, from the ER, pretty much ever, or even the hospital stay. Um, and instead, you would do also education, sit with the patient, talk about and prescribe Tylenol, you know, um, ibuprofen 400 around the clock, lidocaine patches, topical agents, maybe they're going to go home and get a pension, and then they have, you know, three days worth of Norco for true breakthrough pain when it's time to go to sleep, those kinds of things. So if you're interested in taking this to the next level, just a, a slide of recommendations for you. Think about appointing a, a physician or a clinician and a nurse dyad team to be the champions of, of doing education amongst your team. You can take the recording of this if you want, um, or contact Dr. Lee and I. We'd be happy to help you put something together at your, at your site. Um, and lead, to, lead you to that education um, and pushing for those quality efforts in your, in your local emergency department or your clinic or whatever it is. Work with your pharmacy team to make sure that all the medicines that we name today are on your formulary, that you have access to them. It's not helpful to know about ketamine if you don't even have ketamine or to know about nitrous if you don't have nitrous. Um, and sometimes that's going to mean that you're also going to work with your nursing colleagues to help write uh, policies so that nurses have the ability to give things like IV lidocaine or IV um, analgesic ketamine. There does have to be some, some policy writing that happens sometimes. You want to work with your IT department to make these things orderable or maybe to develop an ALTO uh, order set to make it really easy for providers to order non-opioids. You don't want it to be difficult. You don't want them to have to remember all the dosing when they've got the morphine and memorized. You want them to be able to order this other stuff just as easily. And then doing some education with your team on opioid prescribing guidelines, everybody agreeing about having a uniform approach to it, as well as knowing all the information that we just covered today. It's helpful if you can do some quality improvement, track your success, look at overall number of prescriptions of opioids from your inpatient or ER setting, look at number of doses given before and after your program, 
Um, all these are ways to kind of demonstrate return on the investment you're doing in this, in this education, in this work. There are so many resources related to Alto out there, but these are some of the ones that I pull from with the details and the data that I like to review. I also have a giant folder of papers. If you're interested in going that granular, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you want any more information. And that is pretty much all we've got. So we definitely have time if anybody has questions or anything else. Thank you guys so much. This was really, really informative. I am not a medical provider, but I also feel like I could walk in to my medical provider and advocate for myself as well. So do you have any tips for people like me as people are kind of getting the questions in the chat that may, ha may see this and want to advocate with themselves and their providers may not be as up to date as you guys are? <laughs> yeah, you want to take this one? Man. If anybody ever says, hey, can I have a pain medication that's not an opioid? <laughs> like, amazing. amazing. <laughs> so I think really you as a patient or say your loved one is at the doctor's office or in the hospital, because they do occasionally have people who come in and say, oh, I really don't want an orco. It made me really nauseous. I don't feel good on it. Can I try something else? Um, and then I say, definitely, of course. And it really kind of helps to shorten the conversation down a little bit. And I don't waste time talking about why I'm not using an opioid medication. So if people come in and ask for non-opioids, I think that's great. And you can say, oh, hey, what about like, can you do like a nerve block? Or can you do, um, hey, isn't there like another medication that you can use for headaches? That's an IV, like can I just do magnesium or something like that? Like if you can prompt us, most of the time we're more than happy to do that for you. So yeah. this, this video can be helpful for us to help prompt our providers as well. <laughs> yeah, yes. I think if you're a patient and you are listening to this and you, you know, take notes and if a patient ever asks me, what about blah, blah, and I don't know, it's I feel like most good providers will look it up. Like I want, I'm now curious too, you know, and if, and if something is there and it's safe, all the stuff we, we covered today, it has been well researched. None of it is like novel. If a provider goes looking for it, they will find it easily. So what Sky is saying is so true. Like you bringing it up and them looking for it, two minutes and you'll be, you'll be getting exactly what you need. It's not hard stuff to find. We're not talking about like weird you know, experimental stuff. This is all very um, existing meds that we just don't probably use as often as we should. Awesome. So there was a question um, around treatment and, and, and choices around treatment, kind of why methadone, um, people might choose that treatment over other medicated assisted treatments, or um, if you just talk a little bit more about medicated assisted treatment, why people might choose different ones or why a provider might choose a different one for people? You know, for opioid use disorder, I'm so glad that we have these medications for addiction treatment. And it's really nice because really there's only three. There's methadone, there's buprenorphine, and there's naltrexone. Naltrexone isn't my first line because for op opioid use disorder because it really takes someone very, very motivated to stay on it. So say it's a physician with an opioid use disorder and their license is on the line, then maybe they are strongly motivated to keep taking it every day. Um, but generally my go-tos are buprenorphine or methadone. And it's kind of like the saying of the best birth control is the one that the patient's gonna take. It's the same thing. So I ask my patients, I say, have you tried methadone or buprenorphine? And 98% of time they have tried both or one or the other and they actually know which one they want and it's just my job to um, guide them a little bit but people already know what they want and they each have um, benefits and drawbacks I think you know for those of you who are I know some people listening are affiliated with a bridge program site like you're in the California bridge program and our our program uses mostly buprenorphine um, and we have a couple of practical reasons for that. Um, for example, that it's, um, it's not a full agonist, meaning it doesn't fully act like an opioid um, the way that methadone does. And so there is a little bit less restriction for like driving a car or operating heavy machinery and 
Um, usually it's a little easier to get yourself on a maintenance prescription versus having to go to a methadone clinic every day. Um, and, and it's, you know, each of them comes with their own barriers. It's not like everything is super easy with Suboxone. Like, it's not like that. Um, but there are some practical considerations for if somebody's never tried anything, um, there are reasons that we like buprenorphine as opposed to methadone, but it's not because methadone's ineffective. It's just that um, if you're brand new to the system, there are some practical considerations that make dupe easier, but both of them really do work for people. And I think the, one of the keys to that, what we're saying is that this is a chronic disease and there, there are medicines, like Sky is saying, there are medicines for them and people should not be afraid to ask for or seek treatment for their chronic medical disease, which is what opioid use disorder is. Um, so that's really, like she said, doesn't matter which one, as long as you're on the one that works for you, then that's great. And what Alicia was talking about as well is that methadone clinics are oftentimes located in more urban areas. So if you're mm -hmm. more rural, you won't have access to it. I have some people coming into my clinic because they live in an area where there's no methadone clinic. Um, and the other downside is you need transportation to get to this methadone clinic every single day. Although some people really benefit from methadone and I've had patients who do better on methadone because they need that structure and they need that wraparound care that methadone clinics can provide. And so that would be a reason to use methadone. And another reason to use buprenorphine would be you can actually, it's a little bit less stigmatizing because you can actually get it within your primary care clinic setting. And so I have a lot of patients that were started in the emergency department or in the hospital who have never sought out primary care. Like it's been like 20 years since I've seen a doctor, but now they're in my clinic and we've addressed their opioid use disorder. And now I'm like, hey, can we get colon cancer screening for you? And can we maybe check your labs or your kidneys and diabetes <laughs> and work on that? And so that's like a, I think that's a big reason why we are moving a little bit more towards buprenorphine is that there's a little bit less barriers. Yeah, I like that idea as an opioid use disorder treatment as a gateway to better health in general, right? Like, <laughs> that's a great way to look at it. Um, I just have a quick follow-up question, and then Phil has a question. And um, so there's a lot of rumors out there about medicated-assisted treatment in pregnancy and that it's not a good thing for pregnancy. Can you help to spell that myth just a bit for us? <laughs> Because I'm family medicine, I also do prenatal care and treating OUD in pregnancy is one of my favorite things to do because people are so, so motivated. Also, pregnancy related deaths um, caused by overdose are higher than pregnancy related deaths due to hemorrhage or to preeclampsia. So it's incredibly important to address. ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, do not recommend detox alone without continuation of medications for addiction. So either methadone or buprenorphine. And so uh, historically, we used to say you can only use a buprenorphine mono product. You can't use a naloxone combo product because of unknown reasons. Like they weren't really sure. It's like, why gives a medication if you don't really know even though it's not absorbed like there are some like wishy-washy stances on it but now there's a lot of mounting evidence that says that um the combo product is effective and safe and so most experts are now saying do share decision making with your patients especially because sometimes the mono product isn't covered by insurance or it's not available at a pharmacy or the patients have been on the but naloxone combo product and they don't want to switch medication so just talk about it with your patients, but definitely 100% treat. It doesn't matter with what trimester you start this treatment on. Um, obviously, earlier the better. And you, it increases retention rate. It increases uh, pregnancy, like prenatal visits. It increases um, hospital delivery. So definitely start it. Um, and you do not, if you're only doing a buprenorphine start by itself, no matter what trimester, you do not need to be admitted to the hospital to start this, and you do not need to have fetal monitoring in order to start this. You can if something else happens or if um, patients have a pretty chaotic life and they need the extra support of an inpatient buprenorphine start, you can, but it is not necessary. Yeah, take home is, you're right, it's a rumor. 
It's totally safe and it's totally effective and we should absolutely be doing it and not stigmatizing people. We should be applauding them for doing it. It's safe for mom and it's safe for baby. It's safe for everybody. And breastfeeding. And breastfeeding, yeah, and breastfeeding too. Good. Thank you so much. That's something that, you know, I hear in our community and I know that it needs to be, that myth needs to definitely be busted. <laughs> All right, so Phil had a question for you guys, and he's the one that referred y'all from going to the California Bridge Program training. I rem thank you guys so much for being on here and everything today. It's, it's amazing. I appreciate that. And uh, I remember asking the question about, uh, you know, the, the methadone differences and everything and how Dr. Lee basically touched base on the clarity differences and how some people you know like you know in their recovery you know like it's the clarity you know like because of the trauma that they might have been through and whatnot you know is the reason why like some people will choose to go to the methadone you know first or that might be the better you know solution for that the client at the time you know because buprenorphine might give a better like more clarity you know like, and they're not ready for that in their in their crisis Is that true? <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to agree with that, is that buprenorphine doesn't cause that like fogginess that some people describe with methadone. And a lot of my patients don't actually like the fogginess of the methadone, so they prefer the buprenorphine. But if someone has had a lot of trauma, all of a sudden they're like feeling all the feels and it can be really difficult. And so that's the other benefit of methadone is that it might blunt some of those um, emotions. But also the methadone clinics have a lot of on-site um, therapy and social work and other help that might um, really provide more support for patients. Awesome. Thank you guys <laughs> for answering that. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat currently, um, but if people want to follow up with you, how do they get a hold of you? What's the best way to find out more about what you guys are up to? I think our emails, I don't know if I, I had them up before, but it's um, not difficult. So my name is Alicia, A-L-I-C-I-A. Uh, and her name is Sky, S K Y. So it's either of our first names at bridge to treatment.org. Um, and those are our, the easiest email address ever. So Alicia at bridge to treatment.org or Sky at bridge to treatment.org. Um, and we're pretty good about checking those. And um, if we're not the right person for your, your question or whatever, we know so many people who might be the right person. And so we're happy to be that, that launch pad for you if you have anything about anything that involves dealing with patients with opioid use or any substance use disorder in your China with your community resource location, with your medical practice, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us so we can plug you in. We also have a lot of resources on our website. Our website is undergoing a little makeover, but <laughs> it has a lot of resources in regards to our algorithms. There's a lot of uh, pregnancy related frequently asked questions and we're also almost ready to upload a trauma-informed care during pregnancy document as well. So there's a lot of really good stuff on there. There's a methadone quick start guide. There's stuff about what do you do about patients in custody. Um, it, there's a lot. You can just spend- More, more than you want there to be. <laughs> it sounds like there's something for everybody. Like we're trying yeah. to get a California Bridge Program up here. In Del Norte County, we don't have one yet. We're trying to get MAT in jails. So these are what sounds like you got some good resources that we could help build some of that with too. Yeah, there are jail there are jail specific resources that we have on there. So I mean, like really, there's anything anything you could be looking for. Awesome, great resource for our community and for the state and everybody everywhere, really. <laughs> so um, thank you guys again. Um, do you have anything you want to plug or any final thoughts for folks? No, no thank there. you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, awesome. I'm really glad that we were able to do this. This has been great.
Good, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, just a reminder to people that this is recorded. It'll be available in the future, but still fill out an eval when you watch it in the future too, so that we know that you watched it and how it went. And you, up until the end of our series, you can still be eligible for raffle prizes too. We always try and bribe you guys into filling in the help of the evals as much as possible. So thank you again. And if you guys want to, the, the rest of the week, we have Wellness Wednesday tomorrow which is um, we're going to have some really cool stuff including some um, stuff for young people in the morning and then um, Thursday we have a lived experience panel and lots of good stuff coming up so make sure and tune in with the rest of the week as well so thank you to a wonderful Dr. Kurtz and Dr. Lee and we hope to see more from you guys in the future up here too so don't forget about our crazy little community up here on the border <laughs> And Thank you, everybody. Thank you, and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.